All right, welcome back. <clears throat> Today is lesson four, and we're going to go ahead and get started with that. So let's jump right into it. So we want to talk about deglutition. Picking up where we left off, deglutition or swallowing moves a bolus, a food bolus, which remember that is a mouthful of chewed up food from the mouth to the stomach. It is facilitated by saliva and mucus and involves the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. Deglutition consists of a voluntary stage, so that means that is where you decide that you are ready to swallow your food. The pharyngeal stage, which is also voluntary, and the esophageal stage, and that is involuntary, that is not up to your control. It's kind of a uh, takes over once food passes through the pharynx into the esophagus, then your uh, autonomic nervous system takes over and it's not up to your control. And there is a wave of a muscle contraction called peristalsis that squeezes the food all the way down the esophagus and you are not even aware that that happens. Receptors in the oropharynx, which is the part of the pharynx behind the mouth, stimulate the deglutition center of the medulla, which is there located in your brainstem, and of the lower pons of the brainstem, and that's where it takes over. And so <clears throat> you start the process by making the decision to swallow your food, and then once it hits that part of your esophagus, then the esophagus takes over and it will squeeze and force the food all the way down into your stomach. And now, at this point, if we were in the classroom, this is where I would talk about how you are able, because food just doesn't fall uh, from the back of your throat, that doesn't fall down your esophagus and into your stomach. Sure, gravity helps. But gravity is not necessary. As a matter of fact, you can actually eat and drink while hanging upside down because the esophagus pushes the food into the stomach. Uh, if we were in good old room 227, I would ask for a volunteer to stand on their head and I would allow them to eat or drink something. And we would watch them successfully swallow that food or beverage and they wouldn't choke on it and, you know everything works and then my other argument to that is if you need gravity to eat then how do astronauts on the space station eat in a total environment of weightlessness all right so the esophagus has that muscle contraction that squeezes the food down into the stomach and again that is called a peristalsis contraction the esophagus is a collapsible muscular tube that lies behind the trachea and connects to the pharynx to the stomach. It passes a bolus into the stomach by peristalsis, which is what I just described. The esophagus contains the upper and the lower esophageal sphincter. A sphincter, again, is a ring of smooth muscle that will constrict and close off the tube, the esophagus, and hopefully prevents food from going the wrong way. So the upper sphincter is going to be up underneath the pharynx. And the lower esophageal sphincter, sometimes called the cardiac sphincter, is where the esophagus meets the stomach. And its job is to keep contents of the stomach from going up the esophagus. So heartburn is a condition where the lower esophageal or cardiac sphincter fails to close adequately after food has entered the stomach and it causes acid reflux, which is the actual medical term for heartburn. It's called heartburn because the pain associated with it is very close to the apex of the heart, and so that's how it got its name. Um, and besides, it's easier to say than esophageal burn because that's really what it is. So that's why the other uh, more anatomically correct term for it is acid reflux. So reflux of the acid in the stomach contents into the esophagus caused the characteristic burning sensation. And the stomach is a J-shaped enlargement of the GI tract that begins at the bottom of the esophagus and ends at the pyloric sphincter. The gross anatomical subdivision of the stomach includes the cardia, which is right here where the esophageal sphincter would be. 
So here's the esophagus. This is the esophagus. And as food comes down the esophagus and it enters the stomach, then this sphincter will close and keep food from going up and out into the esophagus. The fundus is this very top portion up here. The body is all of this, the main portion of the stomach. And then the last little section of the stomach, what they say is sometimes called the J-hook part of the stomach, right where the small intestine begins, is called the pylorus. Adaptations of the stomach for digestion include the rugae. The rugae, as you can see down here, are these tiny little folds. Uh, they serve two purposes. Number one, they allow for an increased surface area for uh, the release of enzymes to help break down the food. And they allow help the stomach stretch during uh, times of intense fullness, you know, after Thanksgiving dinner, for example. Uh, glands that produce mucus and hydrochloric acid are found lining the stomach wall. A protein digesting enzyme, intrinsic factor, and stomach gastrin. All of those substances work together to make uh, stomach acid. And that is the stuff that dissolves your food into a liquid. So you chew it up in your mouth. You grind it up into that food bolus. And then after a few hours in your stomach, it is dissolved and becomes a very liquidy substance that will then later be passed on to your small intestine. So in the stomach, we see both mechanical and chemical digestion. The mechanical digestion consists of peristaltic movements called mixing waves. So when your stomach growls, that is your stomach contracting and trying to squeeze uh, substances that are in your stomach back and forth. A lot of people think it's because you're hungry. Um, really, that's your stomach uh, doing its job, whether there's something in there or not. Chemical digestion. Now, this is where the stomach really comes into play. Most of what's going on in the stomach is all chemical digestion. This consists of mostly of the conversion of proteins into peptides by pepsin, which is a uh, enzyme that, as it's would suggest will dissolve proteins into smaller groups called peptides. An enzyme that is most effective and very acidic environment has a pH of 2. So remember the pH scale goes from 0 to 14 with 7 being neutral. Anything under 7 is considered acidic and when you get down to a pH of 2 that's very acidic. The acid which is hydrochloric acid is secreted by the stomach by the stomach's parietal cells. So those are the cells that line uh, the inside of the stomach and are there found uh, embedded within those folds, those rugae of the stomach. Other enzymes contribute to digestion in the stomach, which include gastric lipase, lingual lipase, and renin. And remember, anytime we see ACE, that's going to be an enzyme. So once the food is dissolved into its liquid form, it is referred to as chyme. Uh, I know it has a, a CH there, but it is pronounced chyme, almost as if it started with a K. So it's not chyme, it is pronounced chyme. Uh, chyme is the result of mechanical and chemical activities of the stomach. And once the food is dissolved into its nice liquidy form, that is chyme, and that is what will be sent on to the small intestine. Gastric secretion is regulated by nervous and hormonal mechanisms, which mean um, your stomach is able to sense when there's food in it, and also when the pH rises. So if the overall pH of your stomach is 2, and you eat or drink something, then when that substance mixes in with your stomach acid, that's going to raise the pH because you don't eat stuff that has a pH of 2. And as the pH rises, your stomach senses that, and then it, it causes the glands in the lining of the stomach to secrete more enzymes to bring the pH back down to 2. It's a negative feedback loop. Uh, stimulation occurs in three overlapping phases. We have cephalic, that's the reflex, that is when the stomach feels food. Uh, gastric, that is by the presence of the pH that's in there, it senses the pH, and the intestinal 
stimulation. Gastric emptying. When does the stomach, um, how does it know to get rid of the contents? It's stimulated by two factors. There is a nerve impulse in response to distension of the stomach. So when the stomach uh, is full and then it starts to, as the food becomes liquidy, that will, uh, the stretching of the stomach will reduce as the food is being dissolved. You chew up the food, there's still gas and space uh, in all of the chunks of food that are in your stomach. And when you dissolve that into a liquid, then your stomach doesn't stretch out as much. Um, and then stomach gastrin in response to the presence of certain types of food. And this is how your stomach knows uh, when it's time to do its job. Most food will leave the stomach in four to six hours. So the other way to say that is most, most food is going to stay in the stomach from anywhere from four to six hours, depending on what it is that uh, you ate. Carbohydrates leave the earliest. They are broken down the fastest and, and are able to be pushed out and sent to the small intestines sooner than others, followed by proteins, which are more readily digestible than your plants and roughages. And then finally, the last thing will be the fats, and they are more complex, chemically speaking. Vomiting. This is the forcible expulsion of the contents of the upper GI tract. Uh, so this is usually in response to an illness, uh, usually in response to um, possibly having too much of something. Your body basically goes through a checklist. So if you're sick or if you have uh, ingested too much of something bad for your body, your body says, hey, things aren't right. Maybe it's something we ate. Let's get rid of that. And so up it goes. Uh, what happens is the stomach and sometimes the duodenum, which is the very beginning portion, this part of your intestine here, the very beginning part of your small intestine is called the duodenum. Um, that's what you lose. But once the food leaves the stomach and gets further down the duodenum, you're not bringing that back. That doesn't come back up. So vomiting is only the emptying of the stomach. So by definition, uh, this is the forcible expulsion of contents of the upper GI tract, which is the stomach and possibly the duodenum, through the mouth. So this is food going the opposite direction than it's supposed to. Prolonged vomiting, especially in infants and elderly people, can be serious because of the loss of gastric juice and fluids. It can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. It can lead to a disturbance in fluid and acid-base balance. So the stomach wall is impermeable to most substances. Its job is not to absorb nutrients. Its job is to liquefy and dissolve your food. That's why it's there. So most things that we eat are not absorbed through the stomach wall. That's going to happen in the small intestine. But there are a few things that will be absorbed through the stomach wall. Water uh, will be absorbed through the stomach wall. It gets into your bloodstream very quickly. Electrolytes, there are some drugs that can be absorbed in through the stomach wall very easily, which include aspirin and, of course, alcohol. Alcohol goes into your bloodstream quickly. It doesn't make it into the intestines. It goes right through the stomach wall. But since the stomach wall is so thick and has that protective layer, it obviously needs to be, uh, needs to be thick because it has those acids in there. If it were thin and delicate inside the stomach, then you would get ulcers. And that's what an ulcer is, is when your stomach acids begin to eat a hole in the wall of your stomach. So your stomach's pretty thick. It's pretty tough because of the low pH of the contents. And that's why it doesn't absorb many uh, of your nutrients. Its job is to liquefy your food. All right, so that is going to bring us to the end of today's lecture material. This is going to bring it into lesson four. So uh, once you finish watching this, go run on to Schoology and find your questions that will go with lesson four, your exit slip for lesson four, and answer those questions. All right, so thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.